Um, I want to look at the book of Luke, chapter 6 this morning. Uh, if you want to use the Pew Bibles, I believe it's page 1600. That's where I want to begin. Luke, chapter 6. Beginning with verse 17. Now this is known or referred to as the Sermon on the Plain. And this is Luke's version of Matthew's version of the Sermon on the Mount. So there's similarities in the teachings, but the location's a little different. And uh, some say it's because Jesus taught these same teachings, but at different places throughout his earthly ministry, which makes sense to me. But this one's referred to as the Sermon on the Plain. Luke 6, verse 17. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea and Jerusalem and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him, because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you, and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. In my last year of seminary, I did an independent study on the topic of death and dying. And one of the things that this study caused me to do was to pause. I took it, I think, my last semester of seminary, but the final year for sure. And it caused me to sit back and reflect on my journey up to that point, because it had been an eight to nine year educational journey to reach where I had gotten. And it had been quite a journey. And that journey was now coming to an end. That chapter of my life was coming to an end. And as the next chapter of my life was about to begin, I began to think about the future. <laughs> I began to think about goals, wishes, dreams, desires. Where did I see myself in five years, in ten years, in fifteen years? What things did I want to accomplish? Kind of like a bucket list, you know, a bucket list. Those things you write down, places you want to go visit, things that you want to do, uh, dreams that you want to fulfill while you're here in this world. And that's kind of where I was with this class, Death and Dying, because it had, to do, uh, it had a lot to do with reflecting as one moment ended and a new moment began. And as I look at Jesus' earthly ministry, as I read through this and reflect on his ministry, I cannot help but wonder if the crowds who followed Jesus had a bucket list, a wish 
list. A list of dreams. Looking for happiness. Looking for a purpose. Looking for meaning in life. Something to believe in. I mean, think about it. They were living in an occupied territory. A military state. Oppressed by the Roman Empire. They were being taxed. And then they were being taxed on the taxes. And then they were being taxed on the taxes that they were taxed for the taxes that they were taxed with. But not only that, but the Roman Empire employed Jews to collect taxes from their fellow Jews. And they basically said, hey, you can collect as much as you want. As long as we get what is required. Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Anything above and beyond that is yours to keep. So now the Jewish people were collecting taxes from their own people, but they were also stealing from their own people. Collecting whatever it might have been. 20% for the Roman Empire, and then another 20% for them to put in their own pockets. They got their cut. The people in Jesus' time, they were living in a two-class system. The very, very wealthy and the very, very poor. A two-class system. And the majority of the people were poor. Marginalized. Ignored. Forgotten about. Even the religious leaders who were supposed to be there to give them comfort and a hope and a sense of purpose and consolation they catered to the wealthy. They were lining their own pockets. And the religious leaders would add law upon law upon law, making it very difficult for the poor to even begin to think that they were good enough for God. In the eyes of the poor, to be blessed or to be happy meant to be wealthy. Or to be in a position of power or authority. And so the crowds, they lived day by day. Dreaming, wishing, hoping, wondering. And then Jesus comes along. And then Jesus comes onto the scene and he turns the world upside down. Jesus begins to preach and teach and heal and perform miracles, and people take notice. He spoke with authority. He acted as one with authority. And he called the crowds to a new way of life. Not a new religion. He wasn't calling for them to convert. He was calling for them to enter into a new life. Imagine their amazement when they heard Jesus teaching these words here in verses 20, 21, 22. Blessed are you who are the poor. Blessed are you who are hungry now. Blessed are you who weep now. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, when they insult you, when they reject you. This went against society. It went against what society taught. Now, we don't have time to go through everything that's listed here. So I'm just going to start with the very first thing. Blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are the poor. What does Jesus mean when he says poor? Because today, when we hear the word poor, I'm sure these images come to mind. Poverty. Hungry, people homeless, living in tents, living in boxes, third world country, poor, countered with the wealthy. But what does Jesus mean when he says poor here? Because his message was not only attracting those who were financially poor, his message was not only getting the attention of those who were living in poverty. But he was also attracting the wealthy tier. His message was resonating with even 
some of the wealthy. So what does he mean by the word poor? The Greek word for poor here means to be helpless. Helpless. Dictionary likens this Greek word to that of a beggar, one who is seeking. And really, isn't this the attitude that we are to have when we come to Christ as one who is helpless? This goes against the norms of our society in a way because we're taught that we are to be, take care of ourselves, to be strong, to have answers. Yet, we're being told here to be helpless. Blessed are the helpless, are the poor. So when Jesus says, blessed are the poor, you can say he's speaking about those who acknowledge the fact that apart from Christ, we can do nothing. That without him, we are helpless. And if we're truly honest with ourselves, thinking about being poor in this sense, then we'll admit that we are poor in some way. Each of us. Maybe in many ways. Not poor maybe in the sense of the superficial needs or material needs or surface needs, but poor in the sense of those deep-rooted needs, the need to feel loved and welcomed and to be courageous and emboldened and confident and hopeful. The kind of needs that can only be fulfilled through a relationship with Christ. I read something this past week that said, if you don't have a need, then that is your need. Because sometimes we attempt to deny our needs, suppress them out of fear of what others may think, or out of fear of rejection or being ridiculed, of looking weak in the eyes of those around us. In my 20 plus years of ministry, I have seen this most, and I'm sorry, but I've seen this most in men who feel as though they have to have the answer. That they, they have to control those emotions. They can't show or express any need. But what this does, not only in men, but all people, is it creates a barrier, a divide, that prevents us from growing close to Christ and prevents Christ from addressing those personal needs within us that are present. Until we're able and willing to bring those needs to Christ, there's nothing He can do it's a barrier that says, I can take care of it myself. Let's go to Matthew real quick. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 19. And I'm going to skim through this, paraphrase, stop, jump around. But Matthew chapter 19, we're going to find a guy who thinks he has it all. He's young, he's wealthy, he's powerful. I read in one uh, common, com uh, commentary, he described this guy as a 20-something, in today's terms, be, he'd be a 20-something good-looking six-foot guy with great abs. Great. He'd just be the, the Mr. Perfect in today. He's wealthy, he's got a good personality, he thinks he has it all. The rich, young ruler. Verse 16, Matthew chapter 19. Verse 16. Let's look at this rich young ruler. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Stop right there. Because we can get a sense of what this guy's thinking just in this one question. This one question gives us a little bit of insight about this young, powerful, wealthy, Guy. He's thinking that eternal life is something he can acquire. It's something that can be purchased. It's something that he can control. Just like he's acquired and controlled everything else in life. What must I do? What must I do to get eternal life? 
So Jesus answers, verse 17, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Now I want you to notice something very important here in verse 17. Jesus' response. This young man is asking about eternal life. And Jesus doesn't say, if you want eternal life, keep the commands. He doesn't say that. Jesus says, if you want to enter life, keep the commands. That's important for two reasons. One, it goes back to eternal life is not something that we can purchase. Work salvation. It's not something we can acquire by our own ability. The first step is entering life through Christ in a relationship with Christ. In a nutshell, one word sums this up, and it's obedience. It's obedience. You want to enter life? Obey the commands. It's obedience. Obey. Faithfully obey. Give up all that you deem important and obey. It's not about whether you're successful. It's not about whether you're wealthy. It's not about whether uh, you're keeping every command because nobody outside of Jesus can keep every command. It's about the willingness to obey the one who is life. Acknowledging that apart from Christ, we are nothing. No matter how strong we think we are, or how wealthy we are, or how smart we are, how Manly we are, Tim Taylor, the tool man guy, or, or no matter, you may have all the answers and be able to fix everything. It doesn't matter because without Christ, it means nothing. Verse 18, which ones? So, you know, I'm thinking Jesus is probably thinking, all right, follow the commands, obedience, obey, okay. Which one? All right, which one? So Jesus goes on. He wants a list, okay? Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't give false testimony, honor your father and your mother, love your neighbor as yourself. There you go. List of commands, obey, good to go. Oh, well, I've done all that. Which one do I lack? We read on. Verse 20. All of these I have kept. What do I still Lack. So now I'm thinking that this guy's getting on Jesus' nerves. Because I think Jesus is hoping for a different reaction from this man. Instead, the young man wants to know, well, I've done all that. So Jesus gets right to the point. Fine. You know what? Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Then come back and follow me. Obedience. A manifestation of faith. Faith in action. Basically, Jesus is wanting this man to obey and to trust. Get rid of that to which you cling so tightly. He's saying, and I'll bless you a hundredfold. I'll bless you a hundredfold, and I'll give you all that you need. Beyond financial. He's not talking financial here. He's talking your need, your deep-rooted needs. This young man thought he could buy anything and he could buy everything with his wealth, but then he discovered that eternal life was about entering into life through the one, surrendering oneself fully and wholly to him. It wasn't about selling that stuff, but what if Jesus would have started off with? But this guy didn't grasp the obedience part of it. So he had to hit him where it hurt. And it was too much. Too costly. And people today were no different. The cost of following Jesus becomes too great. Too scary. Too challenging. So rather than be the center of life, Jesus becomes a hobby of life. Church becomes a social center. Serving becomes an obligation. And we develop an attitude of, I have what I need. I'm good. 
Go help Billy Bob down the street. Don't worry about other people because I'm good. I'll let you know when I need you. If Jesus is not the center of your life, then you are not good. You have a need. You have needs that only He can fulfill. I'm going to stop there. So I want to invite you to meditate on what you've heard here this morning in word, in music, in song, in prayer, whatever it is that God may have placed on your heart this morning, I invite you to meditate on that as we turn to our invitation hymn, Into My Heart, number 391. And as we stand together and as we sing this closing hymn together, let us lift it to God as a prayer with one voice, one heart, one mind. So let us stand together. Let us turn 391 into my heart. We'll sing it through one time as we close out our worship. Mm -hmm. 